how do these ideas of soundness and completeness relate to the tree test in logic? Let's find out. Hi guys, welcome to The Attic. My name's Mark Jago. I'm a philosophy professor in the UK. Recently on the channel, we've been talking about proving things in logic using the tree test. And then in the last couple of videos, I've been talking about the ideas of soundness and completeness, okay? So if you're unsure about what they are, have a look at the previous video. In this video, I'm going to be thinking about how those general ideas of soundness and completeness relate to the tree test specifically. So this is a really useful step to think through before we get into the nuts and bolts of proving soundness and completeness. So we're going to be manipulating our idea of soundness and completeness to make it fit specifically to the tree test. And that will actually make the process of proving soundness and proving completeness much easier. OK, so if that sounds good to you, you can do me a favour before we get going. Give this video a thumbs up. That really helps it reach more people out on YouTube. And if you're liking this stuff, why not subscribe to the channel? OK, so here we've got soundness. We went over what this means in the previous video. What I want to do is start manipulating this statement in a way that's going to make it easier to prove before we actually get to the proof. So the first step we're going to take is a completely general step. We would probably do this whichever proof system we're thinking about. So whether we're thinking about, you know, natural deduction or trees or whatever, and whichever logic we're thinking about, this is a really good step to take. I'm going to go through it thinking about soundness, but very much the same applies to completeness, just with the converse if then statement. OK, so we've got this if then statement of soundness. It's usually a really good idea to think about proving the contrapositive. So what do I mean by the contrapositive? Well, if we have any if then statement, if A then B, its contrapositive goes like this. If not B, then not A. OK, that is the contrapositive of the original if then. So we've got to be careful to distinguish the contrapositive of an if then from the converse of an if then. The converse of if A then B just goes if B then A. OK, so the contrapositive is the one that adds negations, whereas the converse just switches around the order of antecedent and consequent. OK, so if this is soundness, this would be completeness, right? If this goes from proof to truth, then this one would go from truth to proof. So soundness and completeness are converses of one another. So that's not what we want here. We don't want to be jumping from soundness to completeness or whatever. We want to focus on one of them, either soundness or completeness. And what we want is a way of manipulating that statement that keeps it equivalent, but that makes it easier to get at and start proving. Clearly, the converse of a conditional isn't going to be equivalent to it. If A then B means something very different from if B then A. And it might often be that one's true and the other's false. But a statement like this and its contrapositive always have the same truth conditions. They're equivalent to one another. In the simple case of truth functional logic, just think about what the truth table for this looks like. It rules out the case when A is true and B is false. This rules out the case when B is false and A is true. So they've got the same truth table. That's why in the simple case of truth functional logic, they're equivalent. But pretty much they're going to be equivalent in whatever logic we're looking at. So pretty much whenever we're trying to prove soundness or completeness, we're going to do as the first step taking the contrapositive. So in the case of soundness, that would go like this. OK, so here I'm writing a line through the symbol, like a kind of a slash through the symbol to say it doesn't hold. So this symbol means entailment. So here I'm saying the entailment doesn't hold. This symbol means a proof. So here I'm saying we don't have a proof. The proof 
doesn't hold. So what the contrapositive of soundness is saying, if we don't have an entailment from X to A, then I can't prove it. Okay, that pretty obviously means the same thing as soundness, right? If I prove it, then it's true. So if it's not true, then I can't prove it. I can't prove anything that's not true. So if I do prove it, then it is true. So these are equivalent. But it turns out that it's much easier to prove this form of soundness than it is to prove this. And the same holds for completeness, right? If we're trying to prove completeness, that is, if we've got a genuine entailment, then we can prove it. What we're going to want to do is prove the contrapositive. That is to say, if we can't prove something, then it's not a genuine entailment. The next step in manipulating these kind of conditionals is we're going to think about what this means. So I just said that this means we don't have a genuine entailment from the premises X to the conclusion A. But there's different ways that we can say that. And a helpful way to say it in the context of soundness and completeness is by putting it in terms of satisfiability. So basically, to say that something is satisfiable kind of means it can be true, okay? So a sentence is satisfiable if, from the point of view of our logic, it can be true. So if we're in propositional logic, that would mean some valuation assigns true to it. If we're in the context of first order logic, that means that that sentence is true in some model or other, okay? Some model satisfies that sentence. We might also be talking about sets of sentences, and this is where it gets a bit more interesting. A set of sentences is satisfiable if they can all be true together from the point of view of the logic. OK, so in propositional logic, that means that some valuation makes them all true. In context of first order logic, it means they're all true in one model. OK, so some model makes all of them true at the same time. Some model satisfies all of those sentences. Now, the reason we're focusing in on satisfiability and unsatisfiability is because there's an interesting relationship between satisfiability and entailment. Let's see how it goes. Here's a set of sentences, A, B, C, and so on. Let's suppose that it is satisfiable. Well, that means all of those sentences can be true together, OK? So some valuation or some model, depending on whether we're talking about propositional or first order logic, is going to make all of those sentences true at the same time. So let's focus on propositional logic. We've got a valuation. Let's say that V satisfies this set of sentences. It makes all of them true. So in particular, it makes A true. So what's it going to say about not A? Well, if that valuation makes A true, it's going to make not A false. Now, what that's going to mean is that those other sentences in the set that we started with, B, C, and so on, don't entail not A. Why is that? Well, we just said that some valuation makes all of these true, so makes that one false. So in particular, some valuation makes those true and that one false, right? And if something makes those true but that false, then they don't entail that. Now suppose we swap A for not A. So let's just put in a negation here and let's take out a negation there because basically a double negation would cancel out. So what's going on now? Not A plus B, C, and so on, if they're all satisfiable, then those sentences B, C, and so on don't entail A. So we've got this relationship between a failed entailment from the premises to the conclusion and those premises plus the negation of the conclusion being satisfiable. If the premises plus the negation of the conclusion are together satisfiable, then we don't have an entailment. Or going the other way, if that set turned out to be unsatisfiable, then this would be a genuine entailment. If there's no way of making B and C, the premises, plus the negation of the conclusion true, then that must mean that every way of making the premises true also makes the conclusion true. So this would be a genuine entailment. B, C, and so on would entail A. So that gives us a nice, neat relationship between entailment and unsatisfiability. 
or going the other way between satisfiability and failed entailment, right? If the premises plus the negation of the conclusion is satisfiable, we don't have an entailment there. Okay, so how does that help us out in the case of soundness or completeness? So here we have a statement about a non-entailment. So we can relate that to satisfiability of the premises and the negated conclusion. Okay, so we've dealt with this bit in the antecedent. Let's have a think about this bit in the consequent. And at this point, you might have an inkling of where we're going because here we've got the premises and the negated conclusion. And if you're familiar with tree proofs, you know that we deal with listing out the premises and the negated conclusion. So we're now going to be expressing this in terms of premises and negated conclusion. If we don't have a proof from premises to conclusion, that means we list out the premises and the negated conclusion and that tree is guaranteed not to close. OK, it's going to stay open. OK, so if we're starting off with a satisfiable set of sentences in our tree, we list out sentences, the premises, the negated conclusion, then that tree isn't going to close. And actually, it turns out we can generalize a little bit further. And this is actually going to help us get clearer on what it is we're trying to prove later on. Initially, when we started talking about soundness, we distinguished between premises and conclusion. That was pretty useful when we're talking about entailment. But really here, we're just talking about any set of sentences and the same set of sentences over here. So what we could say is for any set of sentences X, if it's satisfiable, then the tree that we'd get by writing that set of sentences at the top is guaranteed to stay open. It's not going to close. OK, so there we didn't make any mention of premises and conclusions. We just talked about a set of sentences. If the set of sentences is satisfiable, then that tree is going to stay open. And a particular case of that is the one where we think of one of those sentences as the negated conclusion and the rest of them as the premises. So this is a general thing that we're going to prove and a specific case of it will be our statement of soundness. So when we're going on to establish soundness, when we get onto the details, what we're going to try and prove is if you give me a satisfiable set of sentences, then I'm going to show you that the tree that starts with them is guaranteed not to close. So one interesting thing that we've seen here is that in some sense, the tree test is at its heart a test for unsatisfiability. OK, if we list some sentences at the top of our tree, we don't have to think of them as premises and conclusions. If the tree closes, that's kind of telling us that those sentences are unsatisfiable as a set. Together, they're not all satisfiable. On the other hand, if the tree stays open, if it finishes open, then it's telling us that those sentences are satisfiable. That set of sentences is satisfiable. OK, and as a special case of that, we've got the case where we're listing out premises and the negation of the conclusion. And that's telling us about the entailment or not from premises to conclusion. So very similar in the case of completeness. Here's our original statement of completeness. Going through the same steps that we looked at before, we've got if the tree doesn't close, then the sentences at the top of it are satisfiable. And just like we did before, we can actually generalize from that by erasing the distinction between premises and conclusions. We can prove the slightly more general result that for any set of sentences you like, if the tree that starts with those sentences doesn't close, then that set of sentences is satisfiable. OK, guys, thank you so much for watching this far. What we've been looking at here is conceptually manipulating statements of soundness and completeness. And I guess there is two good reasons for doing this. It kind of is good to be able to switch around and manipulate these concepts. That's just good for our logical brains, our logical learning. But also it makes life easier when we actually get on to the main bits of the soundness and completeness proofs. So I'm going to be covering that in 
subsequent videos. I hope you stick around for those. If you want to know when I release those, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. That really helps me out. And if you've got any questions, leave me a comment down below. And I hope to see you back here soon. <laughs>